Hello listeners, Kathy Lawless, Life Story Curator, bringing you this podcast series, How Did I Get Here? A series of interviews designed for people just starting out in their careers, people in transition, or possibly feeling stuck, and giving them access to stories of people who have been there, done that, so that they might be inspired with some new ideas, or maybe just comforted knowing they are not alone, that everybody starts somewhere, and everybody goes through times of transition and times when they feel stuck. Today, I am very excited to be interviewing Mary Gall. Welcome, Mary. Hello. I'm super excited to finally be on your podcast. Well, I'm so excited to be interviewing you. Uh, Mary, I've known Mary now, what, three years, four years? Oh, probably four years. Yeah, and I and Mary is a big part of why I started this podcast, because I'm in one of her peer advisory boards, and I've been working on my business, and she's been helping me work on my business not only through the peer advisory board, but through coaching and then your programs. I, you know, one of them that stands out is the pinnacle gift program that yeah. you uh, led me through. So really how to bring my gifts to the world. So anyway, welcome the Mary Gall, who is a business strategy and focus coach. So this is going to be so. Uh, yes, I'm excited. So Mary, before we dive into what it means to be a business strategy and focus coach, I always like to start with the icebreaker questions so that we get to know you as a, as a person and a human being. So tell yes. us where you grew up, what part of the country, how many siblings and where you are in the birth order and how you think that shapes you. I know that's a lot of questions, but it all kind of leads into yes. one answer. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so I grew up in Kansas in about five hours from Denver, where I live now, um, in the Southwest corner in a town called Garden City. And we were like the big city in the in the region right um but we were it's about 35 or forty thousand people so not huge but it's a, it was a decent sized town to grow up in i am from a family of 10 including my parents so there are my, my mom and dad and eight children six wow. girls <laughs> and two boys yes i'm sorry to interrupt you have to say that again <laughs> yes. Six girls and two boys. So my dad used to say, and actually we have this on his tombstone, on the back of his tombstone, is uh, father to two and a half dozen kids, because that's how he used to say it. Oh, I got two and a half dozen kids, so two boys and a half dozen girls. But it sounds like you got, you know, a lot of kids. So um, that was his, his little line he used to use all the time. But yes, grew up in a really large family, loving family. Um, great times my sisters and i are all very close and my brothers too and and we were just raised in a time of you know love and and we didn't have a lot of things my dad was an entrepreneur had his own business um and in the construction world and um you know we we had enough growing up and we always felt loved and and appreciated and we always knew we had this tribe of people to surround ourselves with, which was really powerful to me. Community is really a big thing in my life and in my world and my business. So I think that's where that started was I just had this built in community being born into such a large family. Yeah. Well, and yeah. I would guess it wasn't just your family, but each of your parents might have been part of larger families too, right? And yes. there's all that yeah. extended family and in the yes. same community probably. My mom's one of eight and my dad was one of 13. So yes, they both came from large families. Catholics. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yes. So where were you in the birth order? So I'm number seven. My mom was number seven as well. It's seven of eight and I'm seven of eight. Um, and there's a gap between uh, me and my next older brother of five years. So my mom thought she was done having kids and then she had two more after, after you know, with me, me and my younger sister. So my younger sister and I are called the little girls in the family, even though we're all now in our 50s. But <laughs> we're still called the little girls because we were, we were almost like a separate family because there was such a gap between all the older kids who were, you know, a year apart. And then there was a five year gap between me and my brother and then uh, my younger sister and I are about two and a half years apart. So, yeah. um, so I act like a firstborn. I kind of tend to be the leader and the organizer and the let's get everybody together. Let's do this. Let's do that. And uh, so I act kind of like that take charge person, even though I'm number seven in the lineup. Yeah. Well, that's funny. I would have thought you were going to say oldest like or the oldest girl, you know, because a lot of times gender comes in and factors in and, and changes the dynamic a little bit. Uh, because you do seem to have the older tendencies in terms of yeah. the take charge. You know, when I hear you talk about your family and how you're, you know, 
you know, taking care of things, it, it you have a yeah. very big role. And so, oh, now that makes sense. That makes yes. sense. Yeah. Okay. So I'm number seven, but I act like a firstborn. <laughs> So, uh, what kind of great activities did you do as a kid? Were you, uh, you know, were you into sports or dance or music or D all of the above? Yes, we, my older siblings all did softball and uh, baseball and my brothers did football um, and we were campers. So we would camp, but my younger sister and I got into swim team and at a really young age, probably seven or eight. And then that was the rest of our teenage years until we were 18, uh, our summers were sent up to spin at the pool and we just love swim team. I absolutely love, love, love and adore swimming and uh, swim team in particular. It, I had such great childhood memories and experiences because of swim team. And then both of my girls were on swim team their entire life from seven to 18. Um, and then we joined a family swim team at one point. So in my forties, I joined another swim team with our girls and my husband and we did a family swim team for a bit. So. I love swimming. I love being in the water, on the water, around the water, anything with water. So I'm super yeah. excited about the Olympics coming up. <laughs> so getting to watch swimmers on a competitive level is just so much fun for me. Yeah. So it's, it's swimming. It's not diving or both. It's yeah, not diving. No, and I mean, I dive off the blocks, but that's about it. I'm not, I don't like heights particularly. So diving straight into the water, not my thing. Not your thing. But yeah. also, I know you're big into paddle boarding because you're always setting up some events yeah. with paddle boarding, which uh, yeah. I haven't made one of those yet, but that sounds like it's super fun and and uh, on the water, like you said, it doing is. all yeah. the water stuff. So, yes, okay. I always, you know, fall in accidentally but, <laughs> so that I can get in the water and swim around. So, um, yeah, it's I just love being around water. So you sound like my younger sister who's always in the water. She's a water bug. And if there was a puddle as a kid, she was in it. My yep. mom talked about that, but I'm like, you know, uh, my nickname is cat. So I'm like, kind of like a cat on the water. So me on a yeah, paddleboard yeah. is I'm not going in the water. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'll find all kinds of ways to stay on the board and not get into the water at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which we have people that do that too. They come off completely dry, never got wet. But yeah, me, I'm always like, let me find an excuse to get in the water. Okay. So uh, shifting gears a little bit, uh, introvert, extrovert, or ambivert. Yeah, uh, definitely ambivert. That leans a little more towards the extrovert um, tendencies. I like to be around people, but I really, really value my quiet time and my alone time to recharge. So, um, you know, I get energy from other people, but I also do need that quiet time to to recharge and reset my brain. So I'm a little I'm ambivert, but probably a little bit more on the extrovert, extrovert. side. And did yeah. COVID change that in any way? Or um, health reminded you of that or yeah but you know i didn't miss people as much as i thought i would <laughs> you know? uh -huh. so i i switched from an office to my home or moved my office to the house and i moved all my clients online uh so i had lots of zoom meetings right as did everybody during COVID. um and my husband worked at home for about six or seven months uh which was nice for him for us both to get to see what we're like at work right because we lead very separate work lives. And so for me to see, see him and hear his Zoom calls and his with his team and how he interacts with people and then for him to hear me, you know, some of my calls and what I get to do with clients, it was really interesting to have that connection and then and then be able to say, you know, I'll meet you at the top of the stairs for a coffee break or something with my husband. It was kind of fun. So having an <laughs> office mate for a little bit. Now it's just me and the cat because he's back in his office full time. So the uh, cat and the cat's cat friend, him. as you yeah. were telling me. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All righty. So uh, on the fun meter, one being a couch potato and uh, five being the life of the party, where would you put yourself? Uh, 4.5. <laughs> You're not going to I like, I like to have fun. I like to be around people. Uh, every once in a while, I like to be a couch potato too. So, you know, I have those days where it's like, oh, I'm just going to lay on the couch all day. So, um, I have those days as well, but I, I really do like to be around people and I like to have fun when I'm around people. So, which is why you schedule the paddle boarding and the exactly. happy hours. Exactly. That you yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, how about on the risk meter, same scale, one to five, one being low risk taker, five being high risk taker? Where do you put yourself? Um, probably around a four. I think being an entrepreneur, you have to be a risk taker. 
uh, just to start your own business and make that happen. Um, so there's some risk involved in just, you know, cutting the cord from a paycheck and then trying new things. You have to be willing to try new things all the time as an entrepreneur. And so there's some risk involved with that, right? And, and showing up authentically to your clients and prospects, there's risk involved with that too. So I would say I'm a, a good solid four. I'm still a little bit cautious in some areas, but, but I do accept risk as part of, part of the job of being an entrepreneur. Yeah. And as someone who's in, been in a lot of your programs um, and sees you on a regular basis, I would say you're more like an eight, but, <laughs> but we all have our different ratings, right? And sometimes yes, yeah. from the outside for me to go, wow, that's risky for me. But for you, you're like, oh, you, you don't know how long it took me to get here. Right. Yes. But, yeah. You know, it looks like it's, oh, it's just, she's always, you know, putting new things out there. And you're like, what I don't know is that that started, you know, eight months yeah. ago and now you're like how long I talked myself so into it yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. all right well Mary tell us what it's like to be a business strategy and focus coach and then we'll find out how did I get here okay well here is one of my days uh, just so you kind of know what I get to do yes for example this morning I was able to facilitate a peer advisory board which is a group of seven entrepreneurs who come together and we start with celebrating wins and successes so many people in business just move on to the next task and we don't take time to actually stop and celebrate what we're getting done and what what we are accomplishing in our businesses and doing that with other people who understood what it took to get there is even more powerful when you celebrate together. So we celebrate together, we brainstorm around topics, we create community where people feel safe asking questions about things they're not aware of in their business or where they're feeling stuck. And so they can tap into the knowledge of these other business owners. And so I just love doing that, building that safe space where people can come and grow their business and learn from each other. And then I get to do coaching calls this afternoon. So I work one-on-one -on -one with clients as well and really helping them. Like, for example, a call I had yesterday, this woman was like, okay, here's my 12 things that I wanna work on and I need help prioritizing them. So we put them all on the whiteboard. Here's the 12 projects that she's got working in her business. And some of them are ongoing. Some of them are one-time things and she just needed some help talking through each one of them and then putting it in priority and coming up with the next steps. What, what, what should she focus on next and what's the next step for each one of those 12 projects? And so some of them we were saying, you know, maybe this needs to wait until the third or third or fourth quarter so that, you know, you don't have to worry about it right now. It's not that important. It's not going to make a bigger impact. These other things are going to have a bigger impact. So let's focus on those first. So that's what I mean by strategy and focus coach. So I can really help people strategize where they want to go, get clarity on where their what their goals are and then help them focus and put a plan of action together so that they can move forward. Well, yeah. And I know you do all of those things so well because I'm one in one of your peer advisory boards. Yeah. And as part of that, you, I've also been through some of your one-on-one -on -one coaching and I've come to you for that very same reason. I don't know what to do next. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Too many ideas and, and which ones are really going to play out, et cetera. So it's so great to have not only a coach like you one on one to talk through, but, you know, I, what I really enjoyed is the peer advisory and that mastermind of it. And um, yes. I can't tell you, you're spot on when you say entrepreneurs don't celebrate. And you're right. I wouldn't I wouldn't look every month and look at what my successes and wins were. But it's such a great feeling to go in and report that. So, so yeah. So yeah. Cool. And to capture what you've learned, right? We're constantly learning new things. Mm -hmm. And so capturing that at least once a month and saying, what did I learn in the last 30 days? It's just amazing. It could be something about yourself or it could be a new tool you're using or a book you read or, you know, there's, we're just learning so much all the time. Stopping to acknowledge what we are learning and how we're applying that to our business is, is really powerful as well. I just love seeing that each each month. And I get to learn it from three different boards. I get to learn a lot of things. So yeah, it makes me yeah. a great resource for my clients too, because I am talking to a lot of entrepreneurs and learning from what they're learning and what they're trying and what's working and what's not working. So it helps me when I'm having those one-on-one -on -one sessions. It's like, oh, I had a client who tried this. How does that, you know, let's look at that plan. So yeah. that helps as well. Yeah. Well, and it's so lonely as an entrepreneur, right? You kind of, unless you've got a, a bigger organization that you form, you don't have that, uh, you don't have those peers and those 
sounding boards. So it's great to have you one-on-one -on -one or you, at, you know, yeah. you with that peer advisory board. So I'm yeah. loving it. I think it's great. And it really has fit so well for what I need as a entrepreneur to keep me energized and sane. Yes. And, moving yes. <laughs> and right. I'll have the word successful. Oh, I'm so yes. And successful. Yes. Okay. Well, so Mary, when you were in junior high, high school, as you're like, Hey, I'm going to be a business strategy and focus coach when I grow up. Is that, is that what you wanted to be when you grew up? Not at all. Not at all. I um, I never thought about being an entrepreneur until I started my first business in 2013. <laughs> but really, never really occurred to me to be an entrepreneur. Um, even though now that looking back at it, you know, it's like, oh, my dad ran his business, ran a couple of businesses, and my mom helped with his business. So it's like it kind of was there in the background, but I never really paid attention to it. Um, but yeah, when I was in, in high school, my sophomore to junior year, I was a foreign exchange student during the summer and I got to go live in Costa Rica on the beach and learn to surf, you know, imagine that on the water, in the water. Yeah. Wow, that sounds ideal for you. Yes, it was a great experience and it really put the travel bug into my heart, right? So my family, big family, we didn't travel a lot outside of Kansas, we would go camping or go visit relatives, but we didn't really have a lot of money to fly anywhere or go anywhere. So that was my first flight going to Costa Rica and my first extended time away from my family. And um, I just really loved it. I loved learning about the culture. And so I thought that's what I want to do. I want to be in the travel industry somehow. And so I went to graduated high school, got my associate's degree at the local community college, and then I went on to get, um, a that's when they had travel school, so it was like a, a year-long program, to become a travel agent. And so I, I moved away and did that for a year and got that certificate. This is pre-internet, so this is when you had to actually know all the airport codes by heart, and you had to, you know, print out your tickets with the whole itinerary and all that stuff. So uh, and call the airlines to book the reservations. <laughs> and so yeah. it's way different than it is now, but, uh, but I loved that. So I got a job as a travel agent, uh, once I completed that course and in a small town in Kansas, in Hayes, America, right in the middle of Kansas. And I was, would book flights and that kind of thing. And, but I also got the experience to do, to plan and, uh, guide motor coach tours for, you know, older retirees or whatever, farmers and their wives. Um, and so I did that. I was, wasn't was even 20 years old. Yet. I was just 20 years old and was leading these motor coach tours. And I, we went down, I'm a huge Elvis fan as well. So I was like, I got to go to Graceland. So let me plan a motor coach tour to Graceland. And then we stopped in Dollywood and we did, you know, Nashville and all that stuff. And so I'm, here I am with all these 65, 70 year olds as a 20 year old leading them on activities on the bus and stopping and checking in and out and doing all of that kind of stuff. I just loved it. So um, that, you know, from that point, I was on a, a fall foliage tour up north uh, and got was flying home because another person was coming to take the rest of the tour back home. And I was flying back to, to Hayes on this little thing and I missed a flight. And so I had to take a bus and I met a boy on this bus and I was like, Hmm. So we started this long distance kind of romance. He lived in Denver and that went on for about a year. And then I decided I'm going to move to Denver because there's way more travel opportunities in Denver mm -hmm. than there were in Hayes, America. So, um, so I moved to Denver. That relationship didn't last much longer, but uh, that was okay. I met my husband the following summer and we've been married 28 years now. So that worked out in my favor. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess. Got you to Denver and got you to, yeah, uh, got me to Denver. Got you to the man of my dreams. And so, um, but I, so I came here thinking I would go work for the airlines. There's a big airport here or, you know, work some, some kind of travel related job. And so I applied when I first got here, but uh, it takes a while to get through the system and I needed a job. So I went and got a job in a corporate office and uh, every job I started, I started as a receptionist. And then one of the things that I do or just do naturally is raise my hand. So if I see something that I think can be improved, I'll say, Hey, this, there's a glitch here, or this, there's a bottleneck here or something. I could just see the problem and I knew a way to fix it, right? That's just me showing up. I've just had that skill. So 
I would always end up working my way up from the receptionist to the office manager or the executive assistant or something like that. So I would have more responsibility. So I did that with a couple of corporate jobs, right? And worked for each one of them for eight, eight years, the first one and about 10, the second one. And then I had my kids. So I stayed home for a short period of time in between each one of my girls were born. And then um, I had, I was running the mom's group uh, <laughs> where we were involved because I had to get out and have to have to be doing something or leading something all the time. Right. In community, so, right. You have yes, my community. Right. Let me, <laughs> let me organize something and throw people together and have a common interest. So I was running a mom's group and and some people came in and said, hey, we have this part time job, you know, be perfect for a mom, you know, with kids in school or something. And, you know, so I was like, well, let me go check it out. I'll meet the people, see if it's legit. And it was at a law firm. And so they they thought I was applying for the job and they're like, you can have the job. When can you start? I was like, I'm just here to see if it's <laughs> to get more details. I don't want the job. And so I didn't take the job. And then about three months and all the time I'm thinking, should I have taken that job? Should I have taken that job? Maybe I should have taken that job. And um, then about three months later, they called me again and they were like, you know, the person we hired after you turned us down didn't work out. So if you're interested, we really would like to have you. So again, started at the front desk on the first day I said, you know, I was looking at their website. I was like, you know, there's some links that are broken and there's some typos on this page. And they're like, can you fix it? I was like, I don't, I don't know anything about <laughs> websites, but if you train me, if you send me into a course, I'll learn. Right. So again, part of that, just raise my hand, I'll figure it out mm -hmm. and, and make it happen. So anyway, I've spent 10 years at the law firm running, running the law firm from going from the front desk to pretty much office manager. Um, I did all the marketing, the IT support, budgeting. I ran the partner meetings, did their agendas, did the marketing for each attorney plus the firm. And um, it was a great learning experience. But after 10 years, I kind of had reached the top of what I could do there other than become a paralegal or a lawyer, which I didn't want to do. So I knew it was time for me to leave, but I just didn't know exactly what I would do. It's like, do I go get another job? By this time, my kids are in, you know, high schoolish age. And I knew that I needed, I wanted to be there for their swim meets. You know, I wanted to be there for their activities. And they, my oldest daughter was in band. It's like, I gotta be part of the band, a, a band mom. Right. So, so I knew I didn't want to get locked into a 60, 70 hour work week. I wanted to be flexible and have some time. And so a group that I was in at the time, a mastermind group, said, why don't you start your own business? And I remember just thinking like, what, what would I even do? Like that is such a foreign thought to me. It took me by surprise. And then my husband and I had a discussion um, and, and he said, well, why don't you quit your job and do something else? And I was like, well, what would I do? You know, cause I, I just didn't know. And I started asking myself, this was great advice. Somebody gave me, he said, start asking yourself the question, I wonder. And then just be quiet and listen. So I wonder everything. So I wonder if I'll, what my new work will look like. I wonder what kind of people I'll work with. I wonder if I'll have an office. I wonder if I'll have a commute. I wonder, will I have to get dressed up? I wonder what my salary will look like, you know, and I just kept asking myself that and then listening and paying attention. Like, I wonder if I'll work downtown. I was like, yuck, I don't want to work downtown. <laughs> you, know, so, you know, all those kind of things, your, your mind just starts to answer the question when you start asking it enough. And then I kept seeing this, this information about virtual assistants. It just kept popping up in weird places like on the radio or in a magazine or, you know, even at, at one of my daughter's book fairs at her middle school, there was a thing about virtual assistants. And I was like, okay, universe, I hear, I get this message. What's, what's this about? And so I researched, you know, what's a virtual assistant. And, um, this was in 2013 and I decided that, yes, I have all the skills. I can help people run their business and they don't have to hire me. I can be a contractor and if they can't afford somebody full, full time in house, then I can go and help them and help small business owners and part of the community, right. And make the community stronger with small business owners. So, I, so I jumped in, started my first business in 2013 and uh, I had clients luckily lined up, you know, as I left the law firm. So I started out with clients, which is a great thing. And then within about six months, I hit capacity. I had so many clients and so many projects, which is a great problem to have as an entrepreneur, but it's still a problem. I did not know how to transition from the doer to the business owner. 
and I realized I needed help. I was stuck because I, I had the potential to take on this new client. And I was like, I don't have any capacity to take on another project. I'm already working more than I did full time. And I have multiple bosses now with lots of different projects, <laughs> juggling a lot more things. And so I realized that I needed some help. And by chance, I happened to sit next to somebody at a networking event and he was like, oh, we run peer advisory boards. You should come and check them out. And so I did and I joined a peer advisory board and started taking the Pinnacle Success courses. And it really did help me to just be able to talk to other entrepreneurs and say, how did you move past this phase? Or I don't even know how to do this, you know, and be open and honest and vulnerable about what was happening in my business and then ask for advice. Um, it's such a thing that we, especially in this day and age of Google and, you know, everything we can find on the internet, we think we can figure it all out on our own, which yes, to an extent you can find it all on the internet, but having somebody who's been there and done that, give you advice and you save you the hassle of researching it and testing and trying different things. It's so valuable. And so, um, if I, I, I want to yeah, pause for just a second there, cause that's so important, Mary, cause I got to tell you, that's. One of the reasons I hired a business coach, and I didn't know of you at the time, yes. uh, when I started my business, is I was like overwhelmed, yeah. and I, I and I saw all this stuff on the internet. And the coach that I gravitated toward, number one, she was referred by someone who I thought very highly of, so that was yes. really important. But as I was going through all of her materials, one of the things that she had marketed was, you can find all this information out on the internet. Or you can have a shortcut, which is me who has been there, done that, and I'll guide you through it. And, and yeah. that was those, that phrase almost just, um, you know, almost, you know, is what sold me and said, yeah. similar to what you're saying there, you know, cause the other thing is, is yes, there's a lot of stuff out there, but it can be contradictory. You yeah. should do social media. Oh, you, well, which social media, how do you do social media? Well, no, it should be about networking group. I mean, there's so many different ang angles and avenues you can go down. So, um, yes. yeah, I mean, that's the benefit of being in a peer advisory or getting a coach and really kind of helping narrow all the choices versus the internet is thousands of choices. So, yes, yes. And the choices that make sense for you authentically, right? Because there's lots of things I could be doing, but they don't feel comfortable to me, right? Or they're not authentic yeah. to how I want to show up. So, so tying back into that is really important as well. Yeah. Yeah. So when it was, um, you then, so how did you, so you, it was a networking group that you said connected you to this peer advisory group, right? And yes. Then, yes. So then I started going to the peer advisory board. I took the, uh, courses that they had to offer and it really helped give me clarity. Like I said, I was able to bring in my first contractors and take on more clients. That was the first summer I went paddle boarding because I could take that mornings off a couple mornings during the, Yay! Week, during the <laughs> summer. And it was such a great thing to be able to put that in my schedule and know that I could still take new clients and give them to somebody on my team. Right. Switch, and the clients would be happy and I could still, you know, get the bottom line done. And so, um, after that, during this period, the people that were running this coaching group uh, decided that they wanted to license their materials. And they had hired me to kind of help set up the back end communication system with their clients. So I got to see kind of the back end of the business anyway and knew what they were doing, how much time was involved. And, and they really believed in me as a coach. I never really thought of myself as a coach, but um, they're like, you naturally show up with resources and options and help people guide people through it. That's what you do in your business. So, um, so when they launched their licensing material, I, I signed up and, and got certified in their, in their methods and, uh, that started success magnified my coaching business in 2015. So I have been just loving it ever since. I like the gift of time because I like to get things done. I like, to, you know, to organize people's stuff and get that, get those projects to completion. But I just love being a coach and helping other business owners get clarity, get focus so that they can get done what they need to get done and have a life that they enjoy. That's really important for me is that people get to have fun in their life. And if they own their business, have fun in your business. You know, shouldn't all be drudgery. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you bring that to our meetings and um, you just always help us celebrate, which is really cool. Um, and you keep that in there, the celebration. I mean, it, last summer, I think you had a, a month of celebration, didn't you? In August, yeah. and you were highlighting 
uh, several of us about what we were celebrating and, and making sure we were celebrating. So that's that's yes. cool. so I'm, I'm kind of keen on celebrating because that's what my business is celebrating these yes. stories and accomplishments. So yes. very cool. Well, so and and so you found this coaching. So you took the Pinnacle program. Was it through that Pinnacle gift program that you kind of finally? you know, all of this started to rock and roll for you and you could see how it was all coming together? Uh, or was there some other pivotal moment there that you kind of went, oh, I'm not sure, I'm stuck, I'm in transition. What do yeah. I do? It feels like a lot of this just kept unfolding for you. Um, but was it, it as is. easy as it sounded? <laughs> no, definitely not. Definitely not. And when I started Success Magnified, I was really concerned about putting myself out there as a coach, right? So it's like, who am I to tell people what they can be doing when I'm the doer on the back end, you know? So um, so that was a big mindset shift I had to work through. And when I started the company, I was like, I'll do it if I can have a partner. So I reached out to somebody I've known for a long time from our law, law firm marketing days and, and reached out to her and said, hey, I'm gonna do this coaching thing. She was on a peer advisory board as well and knew the system. So she was like, yeah, I think I'd like to do that. So we jumped, we partnered and created Success Magnified. And um, for the first year, there was a lot of growing pains. We've both been independent business owners. So how do we work with a partner? That was a big lesson. And then it was so interesting about a year in, not quite a year, it was like October. We both had an epiphany on the same evening, but different epiphanies. So I was just like, I don't know what I was doing, but all of a sudden I was like, I got to focus 100% on success magnified. I was trying to juggle two businesses. We were both trying to juggle our original business plus launch this coaching business. And it just, it was getting some traction, but not really enough for both of us to feel like it was successful. And so, so she had the same epiph on the same evening, she had an epiphany. We had a meeting scheduled the next morning already. And I came to the meeting and I was like, here's the deal. I'm 100% in. I'm going to just give everything to my VAs and let them take over the work for get to time. And I'm really going to focus on success magnified. And she was like, here's the deal. I came to the conclusion. I don't want to be a part of this. I don't want to be a coach. I want to go back to what I do. I'm more passionate about that. I, you know, I like coaches, but I don't want to be a coach. She goes, I don't want to be the front of the room. I don't want to do the presentations. So we both had this epiphany about what we wanted from the business at the same time. And it worked out that it was very amicable, you know, it's like, okay, you went out, I want to take over. So let's just make that happen. And so really since that first year, it's been just me and the business in the coaching business, but that was a big le lesson learned, right? There's, there's some benefits to having a partner. Like you have that built-in sounding board and but there's also you know some drawbacks like i like to just create things and post them or you know without having somebody review everything i do or know the exact steps that i'm going to take because i just know how to get it done right so so um and vice versa so uh we each brought our skill sets but then we realized that this wasn't necessarily what we wanted to do and because i had taken the pinnacle gift course and then had consequently taught it to other people really knowing who I am and how I show up, I knew that I am supposed to be the leader. I am supposed to be the one that's in the front of the room, that's leading these groups, that's putting these groups together. And I'm not supposed to be in the back of the room anymore. So uh, that was a big clarity, clarity for me as well. And moving forward, it's like, okay, yes, I'm ready to step into this role. There's still moments where I'm like, what, what, what is, who am I to be giving advice to entrepreneurs, right? <laughs> then it's like, okay, I'm just helping them gain clarity. I don't, you know, they could take my advice or don't take my advice, but, but I still have those questions in, in your mind. And I think every entrepreneur at one point asks themselves, you know, what am I doing? Is this the right thing? And so it's always coming back to, Am I being authentic to my pinnacle gift? Am I showing up in my giftedness? Am I sharing those gifts in an authentic way? And if the answer is yes, then I'm on the right track. So that's kind of how I got to where I am. And, and there's still days where we feel stuck. And you know, when my peer advisor boards bring their, their issues that they're working on in their business, I was like, oh yes, I can relate to that one. I can relate to that one. So it's not like it ever goes away and you ultimately one day have this ultimate enlightenment about your business and everything could run smoothly, but there are ways you can do it. I've been waiting for that. I've been yeah. waiting for that. And Sorry. now I know it isn't going to happen. So well, Mary, thank you for sharing that mindset. Cause I got to tell you, you, you show up so confidently and mm -hmm. so, and so authentically, um, 
but I also see you show up very uh, vulnerable too at times. Just yeah. you know, you're seeking to understand. You're asking questions. I don't see you trying to be, you know, that question that you have, uh, who am I? And you're not trying to yeah. prove the who am I to give this. You're really just, you know, kind of facilitating and being the peer. Yet at the same time, you have ideas and, um, and you know, like you said, resources and bringing in all of these different uh, perspectives. Yeah. When you think about how many peer advisory boards you've run, how many different people and entrepreneurs and how many just on that. And then you think about the gift of time and how many companies you've supported. You've, you've seen a lot, right? Yeah. Probably yeah. great leaders, great business people, great business decisions. And then the, you know, the opposite of all of that. Yes. Yes. It has been a great learning curve um, to, to learn from all of these entrepreneurs in different industries, different, you know, uh, different business types and models. And at the core, they all have some of the same issues, right? So it's time management and, you know, showing up authentically or, or am I going to just follow any path that's put in front of me and look like everybody else? So how to show, how to show up authentically is really one of the core ones. And then really, how do I, how do I serve the right people that I want to serve with my business, you know, tying, connecting to the right clients. So, and then of course I always bring in celebrations. Uh, in, in a few years ago, I wrote a book, I've written a couple books, but I wrote a book, a business book called vitamin C3 for business. And it's 52 ideas to connect, contribute and celebrate your way to success. So I firmly believe that we really have to connect in our business, not only connect to other people, but connect, be connected in our own hearts, our souls to, to what we're doing. Is this, is this the reason I'm on the planet kind of thing? And, and there's a lot of pressure in that statement. Like what's your purpose, your life purpose. I think we can have multiple purposes throughout our lives. Um, but as long as you're doing something that feels like this is what I'm here to do, I'm using my skills to better somebody else's life then I think you're connected to your business, right? And then you've got to connect to your community. Um, and then the contribute, I'm always just looking for a way to share my knowledge and share the resources that I've learned. I think the world would be so much better. And there's, and there's certain places where we can share that knowledge, uh, you know, on a podcast, on <laughs> those kind of things. Um, but it's kind of hard to find that like in a networking group or somewhere where you can say, Hey, this is what I've learned. I learned this new tool, or I've just learned this about my clients or, you know, whatever it might be. So contributing to each other with our knowledge, I think is important. And then ultimately it's all about celebration, right? Celebrating those milestones in your business. As you do so well, you celebrate people's life stories and their business stories, their career stories. It's so important to capture those and celebrate those special moments and spe celebrate some of the, you know, the tougher times once you're through them, you yeah, know, yeah, to get yeah, to, yeah. to really say, wow, I got through that. Let's, let's celebrate that. Even though it doesn't feel maybe like a celebration kind of thing, but I, I I'm a firm believer in those three words, connect, contribute, and celebrate. Well, and you're a firm believer and you walk your talk. I, you know, when I think about um, you bring all of that to the peer advisory and to Andy, but you show up that way too, even when we're just meeting, you know, in different happy hours and stuff, that's how you show up. So yeah, yeah, um, that's super important as well. So, uh, you know, you started out saying, I didn't really have the entrepreneurial gene or didn't think that I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or that wasn't the direction I was going. And yet that's where you are today. So now you, you've started what a third company, right? You're, oh, you're it's kind of an offshoot. It's an offshoot of, uh, I kind of have it underneath success magnified because I consider it a productivity tool, but um, yeah, so it's a magic meal planner. Uh, it's something I've done my whole life uh, is kind of plan my meals for the week, plan my menu for the week, go to get a grocery list. And so it's a way to just do that very thing. And so it's a, a planner pad that you come, it's good for a year, it's 52 pages and you plan your week's meals out and then you, there's a grocery list attached. So it's old fashioned pen and paper, not an app on your phone. And you can go to the grocery store with a pen and a piece of paper and scratch things off the list. Uh, but it helps with, um, you know, saving you time and energy. When I was working full time and I would come home and I, the first thing the kids or my husband would ask, what's for dinner? It's like, hi, you know, <laughs> my, how was my day? You know, so it used to drive me nuts. Just like, what's for dinner? Or I'd be thinking on the way home, drive home. It's like, Oh, do we have, what do we have for dinner? Do I need to stop at the store? And I don't want to stop at the store. And, you know, I'm already late and 
you know, do we have time to make something before swim team? And so it just, I used to hate that question, what's for dinner? And so I started planning my meals out. And so I created this planner pad to just help busy people with that very thing. It also helps you save money because you know what you're getting at the grocery store and you know how it's going to be used. Um, and, you know, I think about that today about food waste because I was had some nectarine or oranges that were kind of on the getting to the bad side. The skin was getting a little dark and I was like, okay, I'm just going to peel these and freeze them so I can use them in, in smoothies. And I was thinking about most people would have just tossed these right when they get old. And I just have a hard time throwing away food. And so I try not to buy food that I know I'm not going to use. And if I can't use it, I find a way to freeze it or repurpose it or whatever. So they're just those kind of things. I just really wanted to share that with other people because I just grew up doing it. Both my girls now do it as adults. And so it, I realized, oh, not everybody does this. I had a girlfriend tell me, yeah, I just go to the store and figure out what I want to make for dinner. I was like, what? Oh my gosh, <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> so it's like, you have to go to the store every day and pick out what you want to eat for that dinner. You know, that would drive me, that would be so stressful to me. Yeah. So well, I know there was other people like me that needed that assistance. Yeah. Well, and that whole, and she probably goes when she's hungry, which they yeah. say you shouldn't do. And she probably right. overbuys and there isn't that, well, if I buy the green pepper, I can use part here and part there or, you know, right. I, there's the reusing of that. So, well, right. Mary, you know, what I see there too is also um, this meal planning is giving the gift of time. So I, I love when, yeah. I, when I first met you and, and I first knew you about your business, the gift of time. I think that was what, uh, when we first met, how I understood it. I'm like, what a perfect name, because that's so much more valued than if you had said virtual assistant. Right. You know, it was, I'm giving you the gift of time, which as many entrepreneurs, sometimes we don't want to pay for doing, you know, we think we should do it all. And yeah. what you're saying is, no, let me give you the gift of time, because what can you do with that time is more valuable than, you know, yeah. if you sat and did this thing by yourself. So, and I know you've helped so many of the groups and different things uh, by, you know, taking on those projects that they probably shouldn't be doing. Themselves. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and just the meal planning is the same thing. So, well, yeah. Mary, as usual, I could probably just keep going on and on and asking you more questions, but this has been wonderful to really get, since I spent so much time with you to really dive into, well, how did you get here? Right. Yes. And, I mean, I knew the law firm to the gift of time to the success magnified, but I didn't know the before that. And, um, so anyway, that's very cool to hear how, how you kind of yeah. just always raise your hand. And that was a big part. Yeah. Of it. So, mm -hmm. so when you look back, we'll start to wrap up a little bit here. When you look back on your career, uh, what do you think served you best? Can be like a, a habit, a strength, a discipline. What do you think served you? Yeah, I think just that, you know, really being willing to raise my hand. And, and if I saw a problem, I would try to come at it with a solution. And then go to my boss with, you know, here's this issue, but here's what I think we can do about it. Right. So, so not just to say, oh, here's a problem and I'm going to complain about it, but really raising my hand and saying, here's this issue and here's, I think I may be able to help. So stepping in where I thought I could be able to help or add value. Um, you know, I guess that goes back to the risk taking thing. I guess I am more of a risk taker because it takes some courage to raise your hand and say, I think I can, I can learn to figure this out. I can, I can help here um, instead of just doing your job and keeping your head down. Right. But that's because I have been doing that my whole life. It's opened up such great experiences for me to learn new things and, you know, just constantly challenge myself and then learn what I'm learn something new and then be able to share that with others or, or fix a problem with what I've learned. Right. So I think that's just really important and to step up and do that, even though you don't really have a clue how to do it. You know, I learned how to program computers back in the day. So I was like, I'll figure it out. Send me to a class. I can learn anything. And I think part of that's the confidence knowing that you can learn anything. I can, if I apply my mind to it, I can learn something. Yeah. And then the more you do it, the more success you have. And then, oh, well, then I can learn this other tool and that tool. I, I love how you, you know, while maybe you started as a receptionist, you didn't keep the receptionist mindset, which is, well, I'm only a receptionist, so they wouldn't care right. what I might notice or what I might um, 
right you know recommend changing you know it's like no i'm raising my hand and they're like oh i see that i mean that i've interviewed a lot of people that have started in in those types of roles and it, yeah. you know then they just kept saying i want more what else can i do can i help what can i do and next thing you know they're you know one was the marketing director when was like yeah. you, like the office manager but then that office manager can lead to so many different different roles so very cool yes. okay so then last question uh any words of wisdom that have been really impactful for you and i know for you it's probably about narrowing it down because you're always sharing words of wisdom with us in our peer advisory but any words of wisdom that you think have been really powerful for you yes um i love this quote i actually put it in my book um as well but it's called it, this quote is um there's two kinds of people in this life those who walk into a room and say well here i am and those who walk in and say ah there you are so i try to be the person the latter person and say you know ah there you are like i'm here to connect with people as many people as i can so i just love that quote because it just helps me show up as the you know i don't want to be the person like here i'm life of the party i do like to be the life of the party but i also like to bring everybody else along with me so um so i think that's an important thing to do and then you know, again, just celebrating along the way as many things as possible in your personal and your business life and having fun along the way. Life is just way too short not to have any fun. So I know you're brilliant at that, building in this work-life balance and having fun and, and building that into your work as well. And so I think that's so important and it's a good thing to keep reminding ourselves about. Yeah, absolutely. But if it's funny, if you're around people like that, you do more of it, right? Yeah. Uh, but if you're not and you're in an environment that doesn't do that, boy, you can really stand out sometimes as maybe you not feel like you're as serious as everybody or as important as everybody. And yet, yeah, it's so needed, right? We all need that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Why can't we have the smile and the fun while we're doing the work? <laughs> it doesn't exactly. Matter. Exactly. Why can't we paddleboard and network at the same time? At the same time. <laughs> And then fall into the water. At some point, you have to fall into yeah, the water. Yeah, get in the water. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mary, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And uh, on that note, I'll go ahead and wrap up. And, you know, again, thank you for sharing your story. And listeners, if you enjoyed today's story, uh, please subscribe below. And you can be alerted then as other interviews are published. And if you have any questions for me or for Mary, you can find them on my website, lifestorycurator.com, which is where I post these interviews on the blog page. And then I also will post Mary's social media contact information. So if you want to check out either the gift of time or success magnified or her new meal planner, I'm sure all of that will be available and, um, and you can reach out if needed. So on that note, I will say stay safe, stay healthy, and let's keep sharing those stories. Have a great day.